Yes, my paper is, is a bit different to Susan's. It, it built on some of it, but I, I was particularly interested in looking at the power of Australia within in the region. Uh, and James did ask me to cover a particular period in time also, so that's why my comments are, are, are perhaps a, a little bit less historical. But to pick up on a, a couple of things that, that Susan mentioned and to explain what I'm going to do, I'm particularly going to focus on a case study of the relationship between Australia and Indonesia, because I really wanted to, to, to look at this issue of power, as James has defined it, and try and work out actually what's going on. And, and it's actually a very interesting and complex picture. It's, 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 it's very hard to uh, describe it simply. But, of course, um, with uh, Australia also, its, its entry into refugee issues really began with the comprehensive plan of action. It's, it's real interest. And it's interesting that the reason the comprehensive plan of action came about largely was because of ASEAN's involvement. Uh, ASEAN went to the UNHCR, ASEAN equals... Um, mm, <laughs> Sorry, this is terrible. I'm talking off the cross. Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So it was a very little organisation then, it's much bigger now. And so to, to bring this story to conclusion, I'm going to also talk a little bit about the recent Rohingya crisis, which was the region's kind of pre Syrian crisis, in which you know, ASEAN was again called upon to do things. But what I'm going to try and show him is that, that in Indonesia, which seems to be. Um, Base, whose role seems to be based on a bilateral relationship with Australia, which includes the Bali process, in fact has a much broader role in the region. So that, that's essentially the, the, sort of, the sort of argument that I'm mounting. But the other thing that I'm doing that is, is I think, a little bit different, and I'm doing this because I'm not actually quite sure what's going to happen next. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, okay. okay, talk, but I can also see myself. That's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> James hasn't done in his paper particularly, but it, it's there in the idea of productive, productive knowledge, I think, mm -hmm. is to particularly focus upon the idea of the uh, discipline, disciplining power uh, against the individual. So mm -hmm. in a sense, in my paper, I'm looking at, at the use of power on different levels against the individual and how that has been transferred mm -hmm. to the region and how that is actually used as undermining the, the idea of global refugee policy. So uh, Australia has great latitude. I work, uh, uh, my basic argument is that Australia has great latitude to create state-state bilateral relations and exercise influence in the region in both st structural and productive ways, and it uses its disciplining power. It uses UNHCR's resettlement program as a bargaining tool. So those are my basic arguments, because I'm bound to run that. Time. So this is Australia in the region, for those of you who have a, a, a dim sense of geography, so yes, I've come a very, very long way, if you sit down there, that's, that's rather out of perspective, I think, you know, being pink and, and happy uh, down there in a, in a region that, that is very, very diverse and very interesting. And incidentally, I, uh, just a little bit about my background, I have done a huge amount of work in the region on, on human trafficking and work with IOM and UNHCR and ILO, uh, and um, I'm going to bring some of those perspectives in a little bit today. So, so... James asked me to cover this particular period, so I have all, so very briefly, the Tampa episode was when the Australian government turned back a boat of uh, mainly Middle Eastern asylum seekers, and this was a defining point in terms of increasing the deterrent approach that we had already taken, begun taking to asylum seekers. And we became more and more, we have become more and more militarised and it has become a, a, a more and more a politicised issue within the uh, community uh, and it is costing us a lot more. So that's a, an old uh, cartoon. I very gratefully found lots of bits that I kept when I was asked to do this historical excursion. So I think the interesting point about the use of power against the individual, which is, which is, which is what Australia's deterrent policies are, is that this is actually done deliberately to undermine the global refugee policy, that it's done in the national collective interest, these 
deterrent policies that focus on, on people smugglers, despite the evidence that they are not large uh, cohorts of people smugglers, it's mostly individual uh, fishermen, poor fishermen, working perhaps under the direction of someone who evidence shows was actually a former asylum seeker himself of Indonesia. Uh, these have been very much the focus of the, these policies. And these policies, in fact, led to the first arrangement with Indonesia, which was the regional cooperation model. But the interesting thing about this regional cooperation model, which I'll talk about a little bit as an example of a bilateral arrangement, is that the role of the UNHCR and IOM are incorporated into that. Uh, and interestingly, consistent with what Megan was saying, in fact, UNHCR is given a very uh, small budget within Indonesia. There are huge expectations on that IOM gets a larger budget and it, it covers both uh, protection and deterrent activities, including supervising detention arrangements uh, and, and campaigns to persuade poor fishermen that um, they should not smuggle people because it's against their religion as well as against the law. Um, Australia also uses strategic use of resettlement. We are also a big resettlement country, but we have recently stopped resetting people from Indonesia, um, and, and so the US has taken up our slack because it, it, this is considered to be yet another deterrent arrangement. Consistent. So the Australia-Indonesia relationship is one that is much studied in Australia, so I've had the benefit of, of being able to use other people's uh, empirical work. Uh, it was argued in one paper recently that the bilateral arrangement between Indonesia and Australia is an example of incentivised policy transfer. So this is an argument that I take in my paper and I try to show that it's actually more uh, complex than that, that it is... A, 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 that Indonesia's multilateral interests, in fact, are a determining feature. And in particular, I use the example of how Indonesia uh, responded and took some leadership uh, in the region in recent years, including the Rohingya uh, uh, crisis. So Indonesia's role is primarily defined by the fact in relation to Australia, that it is a transit country for uh, asylum seekers. And yet, there's ample evidence that Indonesia knows all about um, refugee law. It knows all about the importance of uh, non-reformment. It, it has laws in place. It had laws in place which have uh, recently been altered to make the focus on people smuggling. But before then, and even still now, uh, there are laws, including a constitutional right to to uh, asylum. So it's a very interesting uh, example. So the regional cooperation model, which I've already mentioned, arose from that Tampa incident, as well as from regional um, consultative processes, which was another role of IOM, about which I have written a little. Um, and it, this, it's in this regional cooperation model, which is the bilateral arrangement that you do have UNHCR and IOM's roles recently. I've already made those points. Um, on. Yes, so this is a cartoon again from the Tampa episode. Australians, do I go back by pressing something else? That just. It's oh, come back. It's come back. It's it's back. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here we have um, our then Prime Minister John Howard with Kofi Annan at the at the counter. Australia is wanting special assistance on its 450 asylum seekers, and, and that, that's being put into global context, including Indonesia's uh, context. So that's, this, again, something I thought was uh, <laughs> through the, the situation into perspective. So what has happened now with Indonesia, although it it knows its situation. I mean, I know I've been involved in training Indonesian officials uh, in refugee law, um, although Indonesia's laws... Uh, so, sorry, the story now is that Indonesia's laws are, like Australia's, designed to make asylum seekers irregular. There is no way they can get there regularly with a visa. These are deliberate policies of preventing movement, of making people irregular. And in the case of Indonesia, the evidence also shows is that, that it would be impossible to, to actually manage that system in any event because the, the borders are so porous. It's a country of something like, I think, 
400 islands or more, uh, and there are many, many issues just in terms of implementing the laws. And so this has led to policies which involve what I call state society border controls. You have a, a, a lot of people who are at the mercy of whoever is in their community kind of dobbing them in, quite apart from official corruption. And so, so my argument is that, that in fact these laws, which, which have a particular purpose, which suits Australia's purpose, in fact are having a not good effect on the Indonesian state society relationship on the development of democracy and could even amount to the commodification of refugees particularly when the Australian government has admitted that it actually paid um, some, the same fishermen who smuggled the people money to take refugees back to Indonesia in recent weeks. So um, the last part of the story is, is, is to suggest that Indonesia has this broader perspective of the world that, that it does carry out does to carry out its obligations under this bilateral arrangement. Unlike Malaysia, for example, it is incredibly tolerant to refugees. Uh, so this problem of dropping in doesn't exist everywhere. It's random, but it still exists. Um, in 2013, Indonesia convened a, a special conference on addressing irregular movement. The issue of Rohingya people has actually been around for much longer than the recent crisis. Uh, this 2013 conference was, was really shaped around that idea, but it stepped outside the Bali process because the Bali process had kind of gone quiet for a while after the uh, High Court of Australia said that it, it couldn't swap 800 refugees for 4,000 uh, refugees needing resettlement in Malaysia. So Indonesia kind of picked up the initiative with UNHCR, which was an interesting initiative at, at that time. But more importantly, during the recent Rohingya crisis, I followed in very close detail all the, all the blogs, all the newspaper reports, and I watched the language. And I, and I noticed in particular that Indonesia, after initially practicing the Australian line of pushing back boats, of, of you know stopping the boats, decided after some archery fishermen had shown them that morally this was not right, and there are a few stories around that, um, that you actually had to assist these, these boat migrants, as the archery fishermen called them, uh, they have officially, they officially decided to remove the policy. Um, so what I, I argue in my paper is that you can see north and south faces of Indonesia, and I base this on a number of observations that I've made over the years. A lot of my work has been on, on human trafficking and labour migration in the region, and Indonesia has had a much stronger interest in trafficking. It has a much greater problem on trafficking than refugees. The refugees are Australia's problem, and Australia is paying other people in Indonesia to, to take care of them. But Indonesia is very concerned about its northern borders and what actually happens there about keeping those, those you know, shipping passages free. And so it was interesting during the recent Rohingya crisis that Indonesia... Uh, um, sorry, I, I won't talk about the Malaysia solution uh, right now. But in the um, Rohingya crisis, the, it, it was Indonesia, Malaysia and Thailand that got together and, and initially started to frame the agenda. Uh, and then, if I had time to do a, a, a longer um, analysis, I could show you how the dialogue around that changed between the 20th and the 29th of May, when the, the three countries put out their agenda. They had, to put it simply, they had root causes first, when IOM, UNHCR, and, wait for it, UNODC came into the picture on the 29th of May, you had a totally different sort of framing of the issues. Uh, you had, uh, indeed, you had the um, idea of root causes last and the security concern about irregular migration first. So you get a very mixed picture in the region, but I think that there is a strong case to be made that if Indonesia alone is taken as a, as a case study, you can see it has these north and south faces. The picture is far more complex. 
Um, as for Australia's actual influence in terms of the global refugee regime, that's, that's something that I'm a little bit cynical about. Australia likes to think it has big influence, but in fact you, you can point to other features of the global refugee regime, such as the fact that you know in Europe we do it, you do at least have um, you, you do at least have guards, you know you do at least have what are they called umpires, umpires cricket term, um, to, you know, courts which say, you know, you can't intercept people on the high seas and take them back to Sri Lanka or, 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 or India. Um, but Australia ha has consciously set out to challenge the global refugee regime and has tried to influence other states. But you know, unlike the European Union with the qualification directive, which actually mentions the UNHCR and, and has actually quite consciously gone against many of the ideas that Australia has has tried to um, promote uh, through its influence, I'm not sure just how very widespread its influence is. But certainly it's used its compulsory and structural power to attack and manipulate the UNHCR, I go into this in my paper, and also to support the IOM in Indonesia in, in various roles. So I'll stop there.